beginning with the pontificate of Leo XIII, that's 1878 to 1903, and then the one of his student, his favorite student, who becomes Pius XI, 1922 to 1939. The two of them, drawing from scholastic sources, drawing from scripture, St. Thomas, confront the kind of chaos and even anarchy of modernity, which is a social problem, with the perennial Catholic position that there are many kinds of human association, but there are three societies that are called necessary for happiness. We can hardly imagine an individual human person flourishing, being fully human without the nurseries of these three societies. The first is what they call domestic. It includes both the matrimonial relationship and the family. It's the first school of love because we know that not just Christians, but all enlightened people know the golden rule. Love one another as you love yourself. It begins in marriage. Like St. Paul says, just as no man hates his own body, so he loves his wife. It's the plutonium grade example of loving someone else as yourself, which spills over into the family in which siblings love one another as brothers and sisters, as kind of other selves. This society is the great nursery because it forms us physically and emotionally and socially. It is the great exemplar of all the other societies. Imagine someone coming into a perfection of their own humanity without, without this society. And the second society is what they would just call polity, I think. And it's the society in which we learn how to love others as we would love ourselves beyond, let's say, cousins. Relative strangers can come together into the order thinking of a city, which particularly emphasizes justice and common discourse about how we are to live our lives together. Imagine a human being not being able to have rightly ordered relations and loves with people beyond his cousins. Maybe in certain parts of the world, but no one would say that's eudaimonia or yeah. flourishing. And the third is ecclesial society, which gives supernatural virtues for uh, another love. Christ taught a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you, which opens up a whole new vista of social relations. So to Paraphrase Aristotle, Leo and uh, Pius would say this, we are matrimonial or coupling animals, we are political animals, and we are ecclesial animals. All three, and by the way, all three of these orders can have the same people inside of them. And that's what gives rise to the problem of subsidiarity. Let's say we take the same 10 people. They're all members of St. Rita's Parish. They're ecclesial animals. All 10 are in different families within the same political order. And so what should be the relationship between these three necessary societies. You can't let go of any one of them. And it would be a nightmare if they were actually at war with one another. It, it would be terrible prospects for human flourishing. The principle of subsidiarity derives from, first of all, the Latin word subsidium, which means to help or to assist. Now, on these three necessary societies, each one assists the other. We should never view subsidiarity just from the top down because the family helps the polity. In fact, polity wouldn't exist without it for all practical purposes. I mean, everyone's education education through the first seven years is all done within the nursery of the family. The family is transgenerational, like the polity. Polity certainly assists the family in a multitude of ways, from legal protections to great civic projects that call upon the human spirit. And the church gives subsidium or help to both. Marriage is a sacrament, after all. And the church, even through communicating supernatural virtue by sacraments and so forth, assists the natural virtue, loving one another as we love ourselves. Now made a, now made a sacrament loving one another as Christ has loved us. So let's imagine subsidiarity, not as a top-down thing, but rather as something circular. Sometimes I call it cybernetical, to say it, it, it's not like an assembly line. It's where each of these societies needs the other. It's a true and mutual need and wants to give something to the other. But here's now the negative. You never assist the other society by trying to preempt their authority or their common life. You should begin with the generosity of giving subsidium because every Every one of these societies needs it. Remember, in Aristotelian, really ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy, the virtue of justice is in the giver, not the receiver. So if we say subsidiarity as a virtue is only in the state, it means that the domestic order and, and the ecclesial order have no virtue of it, which is cuckoo. Okay, so we should think of subsidiarity cybernetically or in a circular fashion. And when each one gives assistance to the other without preempting or canceling out their common life, we have a 
kind of tranquility of order. And what is that tranquility of order? Called social justice. That's what social justice really is, a tranquility of order. Why did we get this top-down model? It was because of the rise of the modern state, especially in the late 19th century. It's the era of Bismarck. Well, this is when Leo was on duty as Pope. And then after Leo's death, the rise of the totalitarians and the Great Depression, in which governments had to mobilize everything. And therefore, the worry was the state, giving so much subsidium that they strangled all of the rest of the social order. But that's not the best definition of it. That's a contingent expression of it from early 20th century to mid 20th century. The proper philosophical understanding of subsidiarity begins with giving, not receiving. And all three necessary societies are givers, and that's true social capital.